Hi, so I'm gonna this afternoon talk about experimental design. But uh, first I just want to remind you a little bit about about last lecture. Is this? No. And I want to remind you a little bit about the uh, last lecture where we looked at uh, images and how to analyze them. And uh, so I hope you've brought with you either images or signals, because for the tutorial later, well, uh, uh, you'll be first in groups looking at uh, your, each other's images and uh, deciding on what, how to analyze them. And then uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, some of them together. So experimental design uh, is, is very important, and it can easily go wrong. Uh, even if one has uh, thought things through, there are always a lot of factors that uh, one can't necessarily control for or doesn't succeed to control for. Um, and of course, when experimental designs go really wrong, it's really easy to, to make fun of them. Uh, but it, it really, I mean, even people that uh, think very carefully about experiments uh, do uh, make mistakes. So, so the, the reason why we're doing um, experimental design is that uh, there are two things. One is a problem that we have, one is chance, uh, that by, if we have a small sample size, by chance we can measure something uh, that seems uh, uh, different between different uh, experimental groups, but it's actually just because we haven't uh, uh, explored it uh, properly. The other thing is bias. Uh, and uh, often bias is a much more uh, complicated uh, uh, thing to, to get right. Uh, it, uh, there are all sorts of factors that we uh, are not able to control for that can lead to uh, very large uh, biases. And uh, uh, this is especially the case in, uh, uh, when we're doing clinical research. So in the laboratory, it's usually we, we try to isolate our experiments so that we don't have such huge uh, biases, but uh, even there we can uh, uh, have a problem with that. But in in clinical research, it's uh, it's always a very big problem. So if we look at uh, when we do an experiment, uh, we usually want to study a process. So uh, uh, this process has inputs and outputs. And then we have different factors that, uh, uh, that uh, affect the process. And these can be controllable. And those are the ones that we, uh, of course, uh, usually uh, change to see uh, what, how that changes the process. And then we have uh, uncontrollable factors. And these uh, uh, uncontrollable factors are what uh, uh, usually gives us uh, strong bias uh, or uh, or not, but uh, definitely so the, we we need to uh, study and think about what uh, the effect is of these different factors. And when it comes to uncontrollable fa uh, these factors, some of them we also or some of them we are aware of, and other ones we are not aware of. Uh, so that's. Uh, but we have to, so, so the, the good, the thing to do, um, and often we don't do this explicitly, which is to really, when, before we're doing an experiment, sit down and really think through uh, the problem. So uh, really uh, recognize and state what we're testing, uh, what exper why we're doing the experiment. And then we select the response variable. So usually people just do this uh, um, without really thinking about it. Uh, but then when it comes to different uh, 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 controllable factors, those we usually also uh, are very well aware of which ones they are and so on. And we often, even before we start, know within which range we should uh, uh, vary these factors. 
Um, then it's a good idea to list uh, all the uncontrollable factors and try to at least either estimate or at least think about what their effect could be. Um, and then after that, after we've done uh, this uh, uh, sort of cataloging and description of our problem, uh, then we choose an experimental design, and then we can go and do the experiment and uh, the statistical data analysis. Uh, and of course, it's when we do the, uh, we are already thinking about the, how to do the uh, data analysis when we uh, define the problem and look at what factors we're going to uh, uh, test and so on. And uh, the, uh, the thing is that we usually do a series of experiments. So we start with uh, investigating a system, doing, uh, uh, testing a few factors, then uh, we, we draw some conclusion for that, and then we iterate and go back and uh, test uh, other, so it's not uh, that we usually design one big experiment, it's that we, we design small experimental steps and then uh, iterate uh, on. Uh, so uh, now, if we have many factors, uh, we do want to explore uh, the parameter space uh, and see where, uh, uh, see what's the effect of these different factors. And so the, the simplest way uh, and, uh, to do this is to uh, test one factor at a time. Uh, and usually, uh, in a lot of cases, it's probably enough to do two points. Within, we, we, if we roughly know the range, uh, we can do uh, two values of each factor and see what, uh, uh, what's the effect of that. And, and the nice thing is with uh, testing one factor at a time is that we if we have k factors, it's all, we'd only need to do two times k experiments, uh, which is uh, usually uh, very doable. But these factors could have um, uh, be interacting with each other, so that we really shouldn't test them one at a time, uh, but it's, uh, we should really test them together, uh, how they're changing. So if we have uh, two factors, uh, and we would test all the combinations, we'd end up with uh, four experiments. And then if we have three factors, we end up with eight experiments. And as you see, this grows uh, very fast, and uh, it grows as two to the power of k if we have k experiments. So for, for example, for seven, uh, if we want to test seven factors, two, uh, values for each, then we have 128 experiments, and 10 factors, uh, 1,024 experiments. So, so that's not doable usually in most cases. So what we do is we need to start focusing on the most important experiments. And that, again, comes back to doing iterative exper uh, uh, experiments. So first we focus on a few of the most important factors, uh, then we uh, whatever we learn from that, we can add on other factors. Uh, so, so this is a little bit about exploring uh, parameter space. The, so uh, the one thing that we do is we, we should randomize the way we measure things. Uh, and the, the, the main thing is that uh, there are unknown and uncontrollable factors uh, that uh, could uh, affect our experiment, and randomization guards against this. That's the, uh, the, the main uh, reason why we randomize. And just looking at an experiment of what that means, so now we have an experiment and control, so uh, red and black uh, dots. So we, if we don't randomize them first, uh, measure all the control uh, samples and then measure all the uh, uh, samples that we do an experiment on. Uh, if there is no change in sensitivity of measurement during uh, this, it doesn't really matter. It's still, we have a, get a high p-value, so there's no difference in this case. Uh, and that's what it should be. And then if we randomize, we also get uh, 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 a large p-value. So, so this is a case where we uh, 
uh, don't have a difference between control and uh, but it doesn't matter uh, if we randomize or not because we don't have a change in sensitivity but we don't always uh, know this so if we compare this uh, same situation this is again the same uh, graphs but if we compare this to if we have a linear change in sensitivity uh, but still there's no difference between uh, control and experiment but in this case because of this uh, change in sensitivity we get a very low p-value now if we don't uh, randomize so now in the other case if we do randomize here we again even though we have this drift uh, of the measurement uh, we can get a uh, we get a high p-value so we can say that there is no difference between these two uh, cases uh, so, so randomization takes care of this case when things changes over the time. So, for example, if the room temperature uh, goes up during the uh, in the morning, uh, maybe our instrument uh, 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 the sensitivity of the instrument changes. So we have a uh, sort of a drift during, uh, and uh, so that's uh, in this case, of course, we can. That's one thing we can think of and make it. Uh, 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 that move it from being an uh, unknown factor to a known factor, if we think about it, but uh, we still can't control it without spending a lot of money on uh, uh, buying a new air conditioner. Uh, so, uh, uh, but, so that's, and that's also shows that some factors can be first unknown, but if we think about them, they become known, of course. But then uh, they can first appear uncontrollable, but if we have a lot of money, they can become controllable. Other things, like if there's a construction next door, uh, is uh, of course known, but it's usually uncontrollable. We can't do uh, anything about it, except maybe doing experiments at night when they don't work. Uh, so, uh, the, so here the randomization uh, takes care of this, but it's not ideal. Because it's much better, uh, and it and it only helps with the uh, uh, unknown and uh, uh, uncontrollable factors. So, but if we, uh, because w one way of looking at it, if we then look at the standard deviation, in the case where we don't have this uh, change in sensitivity, we have uh, uh, standard deviations around 0.8 for both of the uh, control and experiment. But even if we have randomized, uh, the two group, uh, the standard deviations become much larger. So uh, uh, we're not going to be able to detect as small of a changes uh, as uh, in the case if we do actually control for, uh, for this drift. So uh, then the next uh, uh, concept that uh, one can use to uh, improve experiments is called blocking. Uh, so now blocking uh, is used for known and controllable factors. Uh, so uh, the, there are uh, two examples of different, uh, there are lots of different blocking designs. But uh, so uh, for example, one, if we have uh, four different experiment uh, instruments, and we uh, measure uh, our uh, samples on the, uh, we have four samples and four uh, instruments in this case. What we can do is a randomized complete block design, for example, where we, with each instrument, measure each sample. And then within the, in, for each instrument, we randomize the order uh, that we measure the samples in. Uh, so in this case, we will uh, be able to see what is the uh, difference in sensitivity between dif these different uh, instruments, and we get uh, replicate uh, uh, analysis, and then we can compensate for that. So one would be so. In this case, if uh, it's not, if you don't have four instruments, you could also have uh, four different uh, batches of a material that you use, and it's uh, and you don't have, you need to use all four batches to get enough replicates. Uh, 
but you uh, so but there's not enough for e one batch to do the whole experiment. So that would be one example where you use, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, uh, that's, yeah, uh, there are all those things. Or if you buy uh, a chemical from uh, a company or, yeah. So now if you have uh, two different facts. So here we had in we had several instruments. So we had one uh, uh, factor, uh, and uh, for if we have two factors. So we, in this case we have both. We have four instruments and four operators. So then we can do what's called the Latin square design, uh, and uh, this is uh, what we apply when we minimize uh, when we have two independent factors. So uh, what we do here is, uh, so both rows and columns, uh, we're going to uh, restrict uh, randomization in such a way that instrument, the first instrument, we want to measure each sample once. On, or on each instrument, we want to uh, measure each sample once. And each operator should uh, handle uh, one sample. So does anyone recognize this, there is a game where you have to do something similar. So it's, uh, this, uh, this is very similar to Sudoku, uh, where you have to, you have the restrictions that in each uh, row and column, uh, you have to uh, have only each number once. And in Sudoku, you also have the extra with the, the, the squares. But here, so, so, what, so it's exactly the same thing. So for each instrument, you measure each sample once, and each operator handles each sample once. So uh, then uh, replication is uh, the next concept that we use. Uh, and here, you use replication to estimate the variance of your measurements. And for anything you, uh, in, uh, you know in statistics, we need to know the variance to be able to uh, apply different statistical tests. Uh, so uh, the other thing is why you do replication is uh, that you can determine the, uh, the mean uh, much more exactly if you, the more uh, measurements you do. Uh, so there are different kinds of uh, replicates uh, that one should uh, really think about what replicate one does. So, so technical replicates is that if you uh, <coughs> prepare a sample uh, and then you, before measuring in an instrument, you divide it up into several uh, uh, subsamples and you measure each of them. So that would be a technical replicate. Um, you can also take, let's say, a cell line, and then split it, and then uh, prepare, uh, do the whole sample preparation process, uh, and then the measurements also. So that would be a process replicate. Uh, and then uh, biological replicate would be when you really take different mice, for example, or uh, uh, so that's, it's not, uh, it's worth thinking about. Often, uh, actually, people say, call it biological replicate when it's really a process replicate. And uh, so it's worth thinking about what exactly, what kind of replicate one has. And, and so the technical replicate and the process replicate, really, uh, there you're measuring how uh, accurately you can redo measurements. Uh, for uh, when you uh, uh, split it at different parts in the sample preparation. So you really, uh, but it, you can't really use it to draw any biological conclusions. You really need proper biological replicates to, to draw biological conclusions. So if we go back to the uh, looking at uh, 
how the uncertainty in determining the mean. So we looked at this in the first lecture. I don't know if you remember this, but we looked at these four different distributions. Uh, a normal, a skewed one, a long tail, a complex. Uh, so uh, then if we take samples of different sample sizes, so this is then the sample size of 3, 10, and 100. We see, first of all, that uh, the, uh, the distribution of the mean becomes narrower and narrower. So that's, this is behind the reason, one reason why we want to do replicates, because we can determine uh, the mean much more exactly. Uh, then the other nice thing is that independent of the shape of these distributions, uh, we get close to a normal distribution in all these classes. And that's the central limit theorem that we talked about uh, in the beginning. <coughs> so the, we can also uh, determine, uh, we can also know how uh, the standard error of the mean uh, changes when we uh, add on more replicates. And it's, so we divide by the square root of the number of replicates. Uh, so again, the more replicates, the more accurately we can uh, determine the mean. And so uh, uh, then one thing we, we should think about is that we, we're always doing some kind of measurements. Uh, and uh, usually we also talked about this on how to um, uh, deal with an analytical measurement and how to uh, uh, sort of determine how uh, uh, good our measurements are. So. Uh, in this case, what we see is we have uh, done a titration curve. So we have uh, our theoretical concentration that we uh, know that we've added to our sample, and then uh, our measurements, uh, measurement of that. So we see that uh, it's uh, uh, quite linear here at uh, higher concentrations. And then at some point, uh, there is no correlation between the uh, theoretical concentration and the measured concentration. So that's where we uh, uh, set the limit of detection. And below there, uh, we shouldn't really uh, do this measurement, because uh, it doesn't give any meaningful results. So we also talked about different concepts of uh, analytical measurements. So uh, we talked about accuracy and precision. So. Uh, Accuracy is how close we can, our measurements is to the real uh, value. And precision is how uh, well we can repeat our, uh, our measurements. So, so the, uh, the example here, so the real value is here. So the actual accuracy is the distance between uh, the mean of our measurements and the uh, real value. And the precision is the width of the distribution of measurements. Uh, then uh, we also have uh, uh, things like uh, robustness that we need to uh, take into account. Uh, how do, uh, do cha things change over long uh, times if we store them, uh, if, we, uh, if uh, other things uh, change? Um, then another thing we, we talked about was lower limit of detection, which is uh, in this curve here, this uh, below which point there is no more correlation uh, between the measured and the theoretical concentration. Um, and the, also the limit of uh, quantitation, which is uh, in this case the same, so it's the linear range. Uh, so there, we could also have that uh, at high uh, concentrations, we get saturation. Uh, so that's, and this just shows uh, in another way, the difference between uh, uh, what uh, precision and accuracy. So these two uh, measurements have about the same precision, uh, but this one has a uh, much uh, lower accuracy because it's, uh, it doesn't overlap with the uh, solid line, which uh, is the, uh, which would be if we have exactly the same uh, 
theoretical and measured concentration, while this one is uh, accurate. Yes, you can be, yes, and yeah, all those combinations are possible. So here is an, exper an example of a bad experiment. Uh, so uh, I'll go through uh, what, why, uh, what this means, this table. So uh, first of all, here we have, uh, the, in this column, we have a patient identifier. Uh, and it's also colored according, so for example, patient 35 was measured here and here. Uh, so you should be able to see. Uh, then this is uh, the date, and it's in chronological order. So it starts out in uh, July 2010, uh, and then uh, goes on, and the last measurement is April 2011. And what we see here is that we have before and after treatment. Uh, and we have, this was measured in two different laboratories. Uh, the first, laboratory one, laboratory two. And this was a proteomics experiment. So uh, first, it was used the gradient length for the chromatography of three hours. And then later on, uh, one hour, and then switching a little bit back and forth between uh, uh, one, uh, three and one hours. So, uh, and then just let there was no one at the medical school was involved in this, but um, uh, someone asked me to brought me in to analyze this data. So I started asking questions, and it took me quite a while to put this table together uh, before I found out what they had done. And then I told them that they had to throw away all this data, uh, and uh, they have to start again. And actually, I succeeded to convince them to do that, uh, surprisingly, uh, because it's a lot of money uh, that was uh, uh, wasted on this. So uh, anyone wants to say why it's bad? Yes. Yeah, so so Yeah. So so that's I mean, to first of all, uh, when doing an experiment like this, you should decide on how you're going to do it. Don't change uh, the gradient, which is a big thing. Um uh, to change in a proteomics experiment in the middle of it. Uh, but as you said, there is no randomization. Uh, even if, uh, let's say, the laboratory had to change, let's say, uh, in the middle, uh, then at least if you have uh, uh, randomized your samples, you could uh, uh, sort of, you could deal with that. It's still not ideal, but, uh, and then also that First, pretty much all the before treatment, those samples were analyzed first, and then uh, uh, the after treatment. So don't do experiments like this, uh, ever. So uh, then another thing that often happens, so to do a lot of replicates costs money. Uh, so uh, we do try to uh, minimize uh, the number of replicates that we do uh, because to minimize cost. But that also means that uh, uh, we don't get as good results. Uh, so this is just proteomics that we looked at before. So this is now two samples. So uh, here we show the log spectrum count of sample one and log spectrum count of sample two. So we see that there is some kind of trend. There are sort of uh, a lot of proteins that go along the diagonal, but then there are outliers. And then we can transform this and instead look at the ratio uh, on the x-axis and the, uh, uh, in this case, just the sum of the spectrum count 
uh, on the y-axis for the two samples. So again, we see the same uh, thing and we see the outliers. So what do we, in this case, what can we do to uh, uh, draw, can we draw any real conclusions from this? Should we say that, let's say, uh, these outliers here are, uh, are uh, have changed? Uh, so we, we can't really apply any uh, statistics because we don't know for each protein what the variation is. Uh, we can look at, let's say, if we divide this into three regions, uh, we, can, uh, we see that uh, at high intensities up here, uh, we get the thin peak, which then gets uh, wider and wider, and there are more outliers. Uh, but maybe we can uh, uh, convince ourselves that what we can do is that these outliers here are uh, fine. Maybe down here uh, we, we don't do anything because it's really bad. But let's say for these two regions we can uh, uh, take the outliers and say that those are uh, uh, fine, those have changed. So, but in this case, we actually we just picked uh, 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 one measurement, but we actually had replicates, so we can look at that. Uh, so, when we do three replicates, first of all, we see that our distribution uh, becomes tighter, and we can do uh, uh, a statistical test, and the red ones here are the ones that are significant. And we see that most of the uh, really large outliers are uh, uh, significant, uh, except uh, there are definitely uh, things that are not um, uh, significant. So if you compare this to no replicates, we see that there are many more outliers here. Uh, and uh, the, uh, so, so the conclusion from this is that we can't really uh, if, if we don't do replicates, uh, we're not going to get a correct result. Uh, there's, uh, uh, there's too much randomness, and uh, that's the, the main thing. Uh, so the other thing is, uh, which is important to remember when doing an experiment is that uh, the question of what hypothesis do you test? How many hypotheses uh, do you test? Because, in this, uh, for example, in this proteomics experiment, we could ask what the uh, concentration is of this uh, calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase type 2, which is a very specific question, and uh, we can get a very specific answer. Uh, uh, we can calculate the p-value because we have replicates and so on. Uh, but we can also ask a very different question is what proteins are different. So then what we really ask in that question is that for each protein we ask is this uh, 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 significantly different and protein 1 we do that for protein 2 and so on for thousands of proteins. So uh, for, for the first question we can calculate the p-value uh, and, and that's uh, if we only then we're only testing one hypothesis. But here, in the second question, the more open-ended question, we're testing many hypotheses. And in this case, we have to correct it some way. So the, one, the simplest uh, way to correct for uh, multiple testing is what's called the Bonferroni correction, which when uh, takes the uncorrected, the first uh, p-value that's calculated, multiplies it with the number of tests. So in this case, the number of proteins. So we had identified 3,685 proteins. So instead of, so if we ask the open-ended question, the, the p-value for uh, this uh, uh, kinase that we looked at first, where we got 2 times 10 to the minus 6 as the p-value, uh, we'll, uh, we multiply that p-value by uh, uh, 3,685 and get 0 0.07 uh, as the corrected p-value. Uh, now, the Bonferroni correction is a little bit too conservative, so there are uh, better uh, ways to, uh, to do this. And we're going to start looking at that a little bit. Uh, so if we now just uh, do, try some simple simulations where we 
uh, generate from a normal distribution uh, samples of uh, size 10. And then we do a uh, different number of tests. So we plot the histogram as a function. So p-value goes from 0 to 1 here. And then uh, we plot how many tests get different p-values. So for 100 tests, 1,000 tests, and 10,000 tests. And it's pretty much, ideally, if we have enough statistics, it's uh, pretty much it's a uniform distribution. So we get uh, about the same number of uh, uh, p-values in every bin. So uh, what we and of course, so let's say we're interested in so, so these are now uh, 20 bins uh, uh, here. Or, so this first bin here is what corresponds to a p-value less than 0.05. So what we see here is that in the case of 100 tests, we're going to get f we got four in this case, and of course there's a big variation, so we can probably get things between uh, two and uh, seven in this case. Um, in for when we do the thousand tests, we got 40, and when we did uh, 10,000 tests, uh, we got 500. So this is why uh, we need to correct the p-value for if when we do many tests. And it's the same thing, one, uh, another example of why we do multiple testing is that uh, it's the chance of winning the New York lottery is extremely small. But yet almost every week someone wins it. Because, uh, and that's also a multiple uh, uh, testing. So now what, we can, what, what several people realized is that instead of controlling the, the p-value, uh, correcting the p-value with the Bonferroni correction, what we can uh, uh, control instead is the false discovery rate. So uh, now uh, we have two cases. So we have the uh, black uh, distributions. Uh, we again have 100 tests, 1,000 tests, 10,000 tests. Now we have the, the black is the uh, everything is from the same distribution. But now we have added in 30 tests that are from a distribution with a different mean. And in this case, the difference between the means of the two distributions is much larger than the standard deviation. So then, for the case when we do uh, 100 tests, uh, we see that we get a big peak at, uh, uh, in the first bin. Because these 30 uh, will have very uh, high uh, very sorry, very low p-values, uh, because we have this case that uh, their means are very different. Um, so what we see is that we have the, the random where we expect, in this case, we got 6. Uh, so we, uh, and we have 34 uh, total in that bin. When we, uh, so, uh, but uh, it, these, they only change uh, the low p-values. So pretty much we have uh, the same uh, uh, uniform distribution for the rest. So what we can do here now is to estimate a uniform uh, distribution where this level is in this and extrapolate down here. So uh, what we see, and uh, the other thing we see when we increase the number of tests, uh, the effect of these 30 that we added in uh, disappear when we have many tests. So, but what we can do now is instead calculate the false discovery. So false discovery would be uh, if we set the pay value to a certain value, how many uh, false values, what's the fraction of false values in this, uh, uh, in this region? Um, so then we can plot the false discovery rate uh, as a function of p-value. Uh, so now we start out when we have the p-value is very low, the false discovery rate is low, and then it increases. Uh, and, but it increases much faster the more tests we have. Uh, so, but now we can, uh, instead of controlling the p-value, we control the false discovery rate and set the limit. Uh, but of course, the, uh, the false negative rate, uh, which we uh, want to be as low as possible to recover as much of the real signal as possible will go in the opposite direction. So if we set the, uh, uh, the threshold for uh, false discovery rate uh, very low, 
we're going to have a very high false negative rate and not find any of the signal. Um, and that uh, changes with uh, the, uh, if we have a larger difference between the uh, two uh, means, then uh, the false negative, we're going to discover more, of course. But this comes back to the, um, the power discussion that uh, Judy told you about, uh, is that uh, if you do a lot of tests, you're gonna. Uh, you need to. You can't see. You you can only see very large uh, differences. So then, now we will move on to uh, sampling. So that's another thing. When you measure a signal, and in this case, this is a time signal, uh, you have to decide how often you sample it. Uh, and in many experiments, you can you have to decide if you do uh, one thing or another. So if you want to estimate the area of this of a cu curve like this, what how many uh, samples do you think we need? So let's say that we're gonna uh, how many points we, we're gonna measure equidistant points in time, and uh, how to get a reasonable estimate of uh, uh, of the area of uh, this curve. How many points do you think we need? Any suggestions? Sorry? 30 you would get a very good estimate. It's surprisingly low. Uh, so uh, usually, uh, depending on what accuracy, we can probably get away with as few as 4. Uh, so this is just the example of a simulation with three points, uh, and we uh, we see that um, we get a very long tail, but 95% uh, of the cases we're going to get a value that's larger than uh, 0.87 instead of one. So it's uh, even the three points we only get uh, maybe. Uh, usually we get pretty close. And then if we uh, increase it to four, we always get better than 90%, and, uh, and then we get better and better, of course, as we increase. So it's surprisingly few uh, points, actually. Uh, so, so with normality, I mean, you'll have to test and see when you can assume normality. Uh, usually, you uh, actually can. In in practice, uh, it works reasonably well. Uh, but it's always best to to really test whether that's uh, true for uh, for your case. No, no, I mean a statistical test for normality, yeah. But, uh, yeah, because it's difficult to know from the biological system what, uh, yeah, you, you should do the uh, statistical test. Uh, so, so one particular experiment that became very popular, uh, especially when microarrays came around, was to uh, uh, define uh, try to define molecular signatures for different uh, diseases. Uh, so uh, this shows uh, a gene signature uh, for uh, two different forms of leukemia. And uh, so uh, some proteins are uh, upregulated in the ALL form, while they're low in the AML form, and vice versa. Uh, so. Uh, so these and these molecular signatures are usually many proteins together, because you see that it's uh, most of these are very noisy, so none of them would uh, work on its own. 
uh, as, a, as a signature to distinguish between the two uh, uh, subtypes. Uh, so, uh, and, so, so, and the FDA called this uh, uh, in vitro diagnostic multivariate assays, and multivariate because there are uh, usually many genes that go into uh, a molecular signature. Uh, so uh, there are many different uses uh, for this. The uh, sort of, uh, I mean, um, what people uh, first think about with molecular signatures is to do early detection, and that's usually very difficult uh, and not uh, hasn't succeeded very often. And uh, when uh, it's uh, even established tests like. Uh, uh, mammography and PSA uh, are often uh, debated very much how uh, useful they are actually. Uh, but there are a lot of opportunities for molecular tests for more specific uh, 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 predictions, like uh, at the time when the surgeon takes out the tumor, uh, which chemotherapy treatment should one use. So that's a much more defined uh, and uh, targeted the uh, molecular signature that uh, probably can be um, uh, determined. So, because often the early detection, you want to do a blood test, and any tumor of a small size will, if you dilute the protein it leaks into the blood, it will be very uh, low amounts. Uh, but uh, when you, at the time of surgery, take out the tumor, you have usually enough material to do a thorough analysis and uh, be able to predict. But uh, then there are lots of other... Uh, so, so, for example, here would be uh, you t uh, an example of molecular where you uh, take uh, a lung biopsy from a patient, do a gene expression profile, and then... Uh, do some calculations to determine whether it's a, a, a primary lung cancer mes uh, metastatic. So uh, there are some uh, very useful um, uh, uh, tests that are actually on the market. Uh, so uh, it's so for example, this Oncotype DX. Uh, it's uh, 21 genes. Uh, and it's to uh, predict uh, uh, whether women with localized ER positive breast cancer uh, is at risk of relapse. So again, this is now uh, quite specific. Uh, uh, the, I mean, the clinical question is very uh, well defined. Uh, and that, uh, uh, and it's, but it's still a very useful uh, test. So uh, I'm going to skip this. So, but it doesn't always uh, work out that well. So there is one example for proteomics, uh, where in 2002, uh, some a group of researchers reported that they could do early detection of ovarian cancer, and they had uh, an amazing. Uh, they had a sensitivity of 100% to detecting uh, the ovarian cancer. So this is from serum and the specificity of 95%, and a pro positive predictive value of 94%. Uh, so uh, this got a lot of attention, and uh, a lot of people started doing these experiments. Uh, and then uh, it, but it turned out to be wrong. Um, that, and a lot of people started reanalyzing their data, and eventually the, uh, there were, it wasn't completely clear what had gone wrong, but because uh, uh, they had quite a lot of samples. They had uh, uh, about 50 uh, uh, samples, which is not uh, a huge amount of samples, but it's uh, uh, quite uh, a good number of samples. Uh, so they had not randomized uh, their uh, analysis. So they had first... Uh, I don't remember exactly, but they had first analyzed the controls and then, their, uh, then the ovarian cancer cases. And there was a drift in the mass spectrometer, so uh, they 
it was a typical case that where they didn't do the uh, a randomized analysis and because of that. Then there were probably cases that they, they might have collected the, uh, the blood from uh, uh, the ovarian cancer patients in different uh, uh, clinics from the controls which also makes a big difference. And it's even cases like uh, you probably should collect the blood sample before uh, the patients know if they uh, have cancer uh, because it would uh, add a lot of stress uh, knowing that so and could change the profile. So in this case, a lot of things went wrong and it was a very, uh, very problematic because a lot of people invested in doing experiments like this and nothing much came uh, came out of it. Uh, so yeah, so then there was a company that uh, then was uh, developing this test and uh, they didn't get FDA approval uh, because the data was not reproducible uh, and uh, they had really not done their uh, experiment. So I mean, so it's really, we can often afterwards laugh about these things that they didn't think about uh, to do this properly because I mean it is uh, really basic experimental design that went wrong but it does happen all the time so uh, but to summarize about uh, uh, molecular signatures so what we need for that is usually we need to find a well-defined clinical problem and we need to get access to patients. That's another thing that often uh, people uh, try to develop an assay uh, and they don't have access to good enough patients. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and especially not the good enough, you might be able to uh, convince a collaborator to give you samples from a few patients, but to, to get the proper controls is not uh, easy. Uh, so, I mean, I've reviewed papers where uh, people looked for uh, signatures for ovarian cancer uh, and as controls they used pregnant women. So the group of ovarian cancer patients, they were uh, women in their 60s usually and they were not uh, pregnant and then, uh, uh, to, and it's, that's just ridiculous, but people do that and try to publish it. And the other thing you need to decide on is high throughput assay. So this could be genomics, proteomics usually nowadays, uh, or other uh, types of assays like that, or microscopy. Uh, and then you need to do the uh, uh, computational uh, analysis, which you, uh, I mean, a lot of the uh, building blocks of that analysis you've, uh, you've at least heard about in this course. Uh, so again, just going back to the control uh, population, so uh, usually what one wants to uh, do is have uh, a list all the baseline characteristics. So that makes sure that the, uh, the two populations have the same age uh, spread, uh, the same uh, uh, other irrelevant factors, I mean other sorts of diseases or conditions. And so that's the one uh, important uh, safeguard that uh, one can do. Uh, the other one is uh, that one should, of course, uh, do apply the techniques that we talked about, to randomize, uh, to block, uh, to uh, uh, re do, uh, have several replicates, and this is, uh, uh, so those, and also very important to think through how, what are the factors that could be relevant. And it's usually impossible to include everything, but uh, to think of everything, but one should at least think of the ones that uh, one thinks are important and really evaluate what their effect is. So uh, just to summarize, uh, we talked about that chance and bias uh, is a problem and uh, if one doesn't uh, control for that then uh, uh, the conclusions that one gets from the experiment are not valid. Uh, 
uh, we talked about controllable and uncontrollable factors uh, and about how randomization can, uh, is used to guard against uh, unknown and uncontrollable factors, uh, how we use replication not only to estimate the error but also to uh, get uh, more accurate measurements, and then blocking to control uh, for known and controllable factors. And finally, we talked about molecular test, uh, multiple testing, um, and also how we can uh, apply these things to uh, molecular markers, and how um, how things can be wrong when we're looking for uh, molecular markers. <coughs> and of course, I mean the uh, things not to forget is that. Uh, usually you know a lot about your experiment, so use that knowledge. Uh, uh, and uh, these uh, more formal uh, methods to design an experiment, it's not uh, a, a substitute for not thinking about, uh, uh, thinking hard about the problem. Uh, the other thing, keep both the design and analysis as simple as possible. Do iterations. Uh, uh, do iterations of many simple experiments uh, and also there is a difference between practical difference and statistical difference uh, even if you find that something is statistically significant the effect might be so small that it's not uh, of interest uh, and uh, yeah so that's the uh, end of my lecture today and then next week you're going to learn about machine learning from Yin and uh, the idea there is to uh, when you have uh, different groups in this case we have uh, blue and red labels and we want to we do have two measurements and we want to be able to separate these as well as possible but it uh, and that Yin is going to talk more about that later uh, next week so